Can I have your attention, please? So, uh, just to answer a question, I should, have, I should clarify it on the lecture notes about linear programming. You remember we had inequalities of the form, say, 3x1 plus uh, 2x2 uh, minus uh, 3x3 is bigger or equal than whatever, 15, say. And then we might have had something like 2x1 minus x2 plus x3 is bigger or equal than 17. And then we multiply both sides here by y1 and here by y2 and then we add them together. So the question is, why are we just adding them together, maybe subtracting the second equation inequality from the first could produce tighter bound. But that cannot work for the following reason. If A is bigger than B and C is bigger than D, then it's not necessary that I minus C is bigger than B minus D. So summation uh, preserves inequalities, but taking uh, uh, by minusing them doesn't. To see this in the easiest way is to subtract. If you allow y2 to be negative, when you multiply by y2, it will flip over the inequality sign. Right? When we multiply with a negative number, inequality flips. So one inequality will be this way, the other inequality will be in opposite direction, and of course, you cannot sum them up. So, but that's a very good question. I should clarify it uh, in the lecture notes. Yes? In our inequalities, we have something that is more or equal and something that is less or equal. We just multiply by minus. That's right. You flip it, exactly. So you make sure that all inequalities are in the same direction. And in this direction, if you minimize the objective, in opposite direction, if you maximize the objective. Good. So going back to uh, review problems. So all problems on the final will be solvable by something that you have either seen or that you will see. So there will be no need for some, you know, great ideas and discoveries during these two hours. Uh, if you co correctly understand all the solutions and you understand how they work and why they work, you will be fine for all of the problems, right? So it will be either kind of a a reformulation of a problem that we have done, and you have to identify that this actually reduces to something that you have done, or a tweak in the construction of something that you have already seen, right? But that you won't need uh, uh, to do anything worth Nobel Prize. Okay, so uh, let us, uh, as an example, right? Here is a problem, and you have to tell me what the problem is about. So you, you know, uh, you have, you are in a candy store, right? And you have uh, a list of candies, each with the given a price. So candy C1 costs P1, candy C2 costs P2, all the way up to Cn uh, costs Pn, right? And you have a certain amount of money, say, A. And uh, because you have quite a lot of experience eating candies, uh, for each of them, you know how much satisfaction you get, which is a number, say, between 1 and 100, right? So S1, S2, up to 
SN. Your task is to choose candies, and you can choose multiple candies of the same kind, that you can afford with the amount of money A that you have so that some total of the pleasure that you get by gobbling them up is maximized. What is this problem? Let me hear more of you. I was getting a vertigo, and I was wondering why. If I have to be on a leash, then at least it should be a straight leash. Okay, so what is this problem? How do we call this problem? It's just verbatim what we have done in class, actually what uh, um, Harris had done while I was in China. This is just a straight application of the knapsack problem, right? The capacity of your... Um, of your knapsack is A, the sizes of the items are the prices, and the values of the items are these satisfaction numbers. And what you want to do in the knapsack of capacity A, you want to pack items so that the sum total of their sizes, namely costs, does not exceed A, but the resulting uh, um, value of the knapsack, A sum of all of these uh, satisfaction coefficients, is as large as possible, right? So you should be able to identify on the exam among all of the problems that are in the lecture notes, uh, just you have to kind of make sure you understand what is behind so that you can identify when you see a, um, a new problem of, uh, of that kind. So now that we have covered uh, NP uh, completeness, knapsack is actually an NP hard problem. There is no feasible solution for it. Because uh, how do we solve knapsack? What we, uh, we make a table for all the values, for all the sizes of the knapsack, starting with size 1 all the way up to size A. Right? How long is this array? This array has A many cells, right? But in the statement of the problem, if A, A is given in some base, right? If it's given in binary, then the size of the representation of A is only log A. So you are actually doing exponentially many steps, right? Uh, in the size of the problem description. But that's the best what we can do because, as I mentioned, knapsack is uh, NP-hard. And in fact, this was one of the uh, 21 problems that uh, Karp uh, showed in his original famous paper, right? So how do we solve knapsack problem? Well, we assume that uh, uh, we solved it for all uh, cells of index J that is strictly smaller than I. And uh, you want to solve it for the knapsack of size I. How do we proceed by recursion? What value do we put here? You put you go through all of the possible items, right? And you simply take max 
of optimal solution for size um, i minus uh, p k, right, plus s k when k uh, ranges between 1 and uh, n. Right, you simply try, you simply say, okay, in my optimal solution, I might have an object of size P1. I just then look, if I have one object of size P1, I look how much I can put in a knapsack of size I minus the size of P1. Now, why do we have to range over all of these? Right? Um, why not just uh, pick any of these, uh, of the items, you simply remove it from your, you, you, you simply put that item and see what you can uh, do optimally with the rest. Because we don't know what. We don't know whether optimal solution for the knapsack of size i has object P1. So you don't know, you cannot. So you have to check through all possibilities, right? Uh, and pick one that is optimal, right? So you simply go, you are putting one object in the knapsack and then looking up in the table, what can you stuff in the remainder, right? And you try with all possible uh, items that, right? Okay, so where am I using here the assumption that I can have multiple uh, copies, multiple objects of the same kind? I'm here, in order for this to work, I have to assume that the, I have unlimited supply for objects of each kind. Why is that so? Exactly. So you see, the point is, for this to be valid, I must assume I have arbitrary many copies of PK, because if I have a limited number of copies of PK, maybe this optimal solution here already used up all the copies. And yet I'm testing here whether I can take another one. So for that reason, right here, I have to assume uh, that um, all, all items are available with an unlimited number. How do we solve this problem if uh, we assume that um, if we cannot duplicate. So you have a certain number of objects. Some of them might be equal, uh, but uh, you cannot have arbitrary many of each kind. How do we solve knapsack problem in, uh, in this case, right? Well, this is where knapsack becomes two-dimensional, right? Because you have to keep track what you have taken. Because if you have taken an item, you cannot take it again. Each item, it's not just uh, kinds of items that are provided. So then the knapsack problem is parameterized here by items. You order items in any possible way, right? And um, here you have all the, all the values between 1 and A. So assume here that now some of the items may be the same, the same uh, size and the same value, but uh, they are all listed here. So each object can be taken only once, right? So now, you see, uh, in your recursion, if you want to fill the for slot uh, slot for the knapsack of size i, uh, taking objects 
up to j, then you consider the following. In that optimal solution, either I will take j or I will not take j, right? If I uh, do not take j object, then the solution will be exactly given in this cell here, right? Because that's for the same size knapsack, but my choice of objects only go up to j minus 1. If I do take this object, right, then what am I left with? Uh, I can take it only once, right? So the, the choice for other objects are all up to j minus 1 only, right? But my knapsack now is of reduced size, so I will look this, if this is i, I will look this at i minus uh, pj, right? Because this is how much space I have left in my knapsack of capacity i if I do take um, object uh, j. And I can fill the rest with any of these objects. So I'll take, I look at this number, and I add to this uh, whatever optimal solution here is. So opt of uh, i minus uh, pj, right? And uh, uh, up to, with objects up to j minus 1 right, plus the value of the object that I decided to take. So it will be sj. And I also look at opt of the same size knapsack, but only with the objects of size, or only with the objects up to j minus 1. So this situation corresponds to if I decide to take object uh, uh, j, this situation corresponds to if I don't take object j, then my choices are only up to object j minus 1, but the knapsack size remains i. And I take max of these two. And this is what goes uh, here in the j cell. Now notice it was a very good question that I got in email. We always look only at a cell that is below i cell and on the left of the i cell. So you have a choice to fill this table either row wise or column wise, right? Because either way, you will, be, you will have both these entries available. Now you can think of kind of polishing this problem a bit more. For example, you can have uh, uh, that uh, all the cookies have certain number of calories, right? And you also have to constrain how much calories you are allowed to eat. Right? That would be equivalent to having a knapsack that has limited weight capacity and limited uh, volume capacity. And then you would do a recursion not only in two dimensions but in three dimensions because you have to look for weight capacity and uh, uh, size uh, volume capacity. So there are, what I'm trying to tell you is all of these solutions can be tweaked in gazillions of ways uh, to solve uh, additional problems. Okay. Now, so important thing is I always get this question, how to prepare for the final. The absolute must is to read the lecture notes and scrutinize each solution and understand why it was done exactly in the way it was done. Um, 
during the week, we won't be able to cover all of these, uh, how many, 30-something problems. Try to solve uh, whatever we don't do here today. Try to solve as many of them as you can before Monday. Because on Monday, we will continue going through all of these problems, right? Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to post another set for you to practice. And if you go through all of these, I can bet my life that you are going to pass with flying colors, okay? So it's the matter, and you drill yourself uh, to solve problems using, these are uh, techniques that solve 90% uh, of uh, uh, practical problems out there. Uh, so you just, you know, if you are learning how to play chess, someone tells you what openings there are, uh, how you do the endings and things like that. So this is really just kind of getting your skill up to something that you can really use out there. And I, I keep saying that, and I can, you know, I, I'll post it on the web. I get letters from former students who pass Google interviews by being asked a puzzle that uh, was solvable by the methods in the class, like Anthony Morris and uh, a whole bunch of people that are making a fortune unlike me. <clears throat> <laughs> okay. So um, here is another example of uh, just identifying the problem. You are a biologist, okay? And there is a hypothesis that larger an elephant is, higher his IQ is. And you want, and you have, you travel to Africa, right? And you got a collection of 2,000 elephants, and you give them IQ test. I am not sure exactly how you do that, but uh, okay. So you, what you want, you want to disprove the conjecture. So you want to find the longest sequence of elephants whose weight is increasing, but their IQ is decreasing. You see, if IQ was correlated with the weight, I would be a bloody genius. <laughs> OK, how would you solve this problem? So you have a whole bunch of elephants, and you know their IQs and their weights. And you want to find the longest chain of elephants so that their weight is increasing, but the IQs are decreasing. How would you solve this problem? To help you, it's a problem that you know the solution if you read the lecture notes. What is this problem essentially about? Hmm? So you want elephants you sort the elephants according to decreasing IQ. So IQ is decreasing. And now you look at their weights, W1, W2, W3, and so forth. On this sequence of weights, what do you have to find? The longest increasing subsequence. Yes? Can't you do it the other way around? You can do it the other way around. Then you would solve the problem of finding the longest decreasing sequence, which is solvable exactly in the same way as the longest increasing sequence. Right? So there it is, a problem that is essentially something that you have seen. And if you understood the lecture notes, you will simply identify. Here is another one like this. So rather than elephants, you have a bunch of towns, right, on one side of the river bank, right? So these are the, uh, these are the 
towns, right? And we can label them as one, two, three, four, up to n, right? And on the other, um, on the other bank, you have airports that was built, and airport was built by the money from the corresponding city here. And so here is uh, airport uh, E1. Uh, say maybe that corresponds to the city 2. This one corresponds to the city 5. This one corresponds to city 3, and so forth. And now you want to build bridges across the river, right? Uh, or at least you want to promise that you will build bridges ac across the river, but two bridges cannot cross. And you want to promise to your electorate that you will build uh, as many bridges as possible that connect the city with the corresponding uh, uh, airport on the other side. How do we solve this problem? What does it mean? When do two bridges intersect? If they are in reverse order. So what do you have to find out of this sequence of bridges? Longest increasing subsequence, right? Because the bridges will not intersect if and only if this index is smaller than that index. Otherwise, they will cross. So this is 5 and this is 2 here, say. Right? If uh, this is in the opposite order, then bridges will cross. So you have to simply find the longest increasing subsequence. And again, if you understood uh, the longest increasing subsequence um, solution, it will be a piece of cake to reduce this one to that. Okay, so here is the next problem. So this is type of problems that are just directly reducible to something that you have seen. Well, maybe sometimes it's the reduction doesn't quite work, but it's the very same idea. So you remember last time we mentioned that before you can start doing recursion, you have to decide about the ordering along which you will recurse. What will be sub-problems? Which sub-problem has to be solved before uh, an, uh, before another sub problem, in what order you should fill the table, right? Um, so, first you have to find the appropriate ordering so, so that you don't miss solution. So, ordering and the second thing is uh, that you want to uh, identify correctly what sub problems are. And it's important to remember that sometimes the sub-problems are not quite the sub-problems of the original problem, but maybe something more general. You make your life harder by kind of doing more things than what you really need to, but in order to make sure that you have a simple recursion, that you have a valid recursion about sub-problems. So here is a problem. You have a bunch of boxes. You know this, they did uh, these uh, experiments, uh, right? They would suspend a banana from the ceiling and would give uh, uh, chimps a bunch of boxes. Uh, and lo and behold, after a while, chimps figure out that they can stack the boxes to reach the banana, right? <clears throat> now, you have a special kind of chimps that are good programmers, okay? So uh, you give them a bunch of boxes. And actually, you give them a bunch of kind of boxes. So you can have unlimited supply of boxes of any kind. 
and you want to, and you are given the dimensions of each box. And you want to build as high tower as possible, but in each step, you are allowed to put one box on the top of another box, if and only if both dimensions of the next box are strictly smaller than dimensions of the previous box, so that the monkeys have where to step, right? How would you solve this problem? First of all, we have to recurse, right? And you have boxes of type 1, 2, up to n. And the idea is, OK, let's see, using first uh, i many boxes, how high I can get. But I have to make sure that this height, right, I, that I'm not missing a solution because Maybe a box from here can be put here to increase the height, right? So that you don't miss uh, the optimal solution. So you will stack, so you order the boxes, and each box that you put on top will have higher index. But you have to make sure that optimal solution will not miss because it is not the case that uh, optimal solution require this box to precede that box, right? So you have to find an ordering that, is, that guarantees you that if you recurse along that ordering, you are not going to miss the optimal solution. Okay, so we have to make sure that the ordering is such that box with larger index cannot go underneath. So according to what criterion then do we order boxes? Each box has three dimensions. Do we, and we can flip the boxes around, right? So essentially each box is equivalent to how many? Six boxes, right? Because six, uh, three sides, and you can put it like this or like that, right? Yes? Can you rotate the boxes and then add that as a potential box? Yes, you can rotate the boxes this way and that way. You can put a box in any order you want. How do you sort the boxes? How do you order the boxes for your recursion? What is the property that is definitely satisfied? Yes? By? by both dimensions. By both dimensions. That will be only a partial ordering. It's not a linear ordering convenient for recursion. Yes? Max, well, you know, it can be something very narrow. And so, but what is definitely, if a box can fit on top of another box, what is definitely property of the smaller box compared to the larger box? Hmm? The area of the basis. So we order, so order the boxes by the area of their base breaking even arbitrarily. Right? So the boxes will be ordered by uh, the surface area of their base, right? And now it is clear that any tower of boxes, if this is the top box, nothing from here can be used to make a higher tower because it will have larger surface area, so there is no way 
that it can sit on top of this. So that's the first step. Find appropriate ordering so that you don't miss the optimal solution. Yes? But it will again give not the complete ordering because they, they are not always uh, square. They might be rectangular, right? It's yeah. But we still order them by the surface area. So you fix, you rotate, you make six boxes out of each one. Right? Because each box has three different sides. And you can put it this way or that way, so six positions. So <clears throat> you order them so that each next box has surface area bigger or equal than the previous one. And now it's clear <clears throat> any legitimate tower of boxes has to respect this ordering, right? Uh, when you stack them, uh, the, each box higher towards the top is later in the list. So that's the first trick, finding the, uh, the right ordering. The second trick is, uh, what problems should we solve? What are the sub-problems? When you have a linear ordering, right, usually you look for optimal solution that utilizes first i many boxes. But to make the recursion simple, you include, you force that the i-t box has to be included. Right? Because if the i-t box has to be included, recursion will be simple because... So, let's, if then we will find optimal solution up to all j. Assume that we found optimal solution for all j, where j are subsequences of shorter length. So j is smaller than i. Now, <clears throat> assume that I found optimal solution. What is the highest tower that can be built out of these boxes? Because I force that the last box has to be taken, right? The only way how uh, the, the optimal solution for i is obtained from optimal solutions of the previous boxes, looking only at those boxes so that, that have strictly larger uh, side, both sides larger than this box. So you will look at uh, the cases where all the, um, sorry, yeah, where both dimensions are strictly small, strictly larger than these two dimensions. Look what the height of this optimal solution is. Pick the largest one and extend it with box i. Yes? You try, so you replace each box with six boxes that correspond to all possible rotations. And now, out of this whole collection, you order them according to surface area of the base. So all the rotations will be somewhere in the chain, right, in the ordering. Right? So, and so uh, the, oh, the sub problems will be find the highest tower that can be built from the boxes up to i one. Right? And how do we recurse? We simply look just in the uh, longest increasing subsequence, right? We were looking for all i's, for all uh, numbers that were smaller than i, so that you can extend, right? And among these, you find optimal solution. So, again, 
for you look for all boxes that have both sides strictly larger than the sides of the height. You look what is the highest pre in the table, right? What is the optimal solution for them? What's the highest tower? You pick the largest and extend it with the height box. And you finish the recursion from the beginning to the end. Now, the, your solution is not the one that you do at the end, because at the end you will have a highest tower that must include the end box. So now you simply scan all these optimal solutions and pick the largest. So you do another scan, just picking the largest. Yes? You said that you basically replace each box with six copies of it to yes. represent the different ways it can be placed. So wouldn't you need extra logic to make sure you don't use the same box twice? No, no, you can use, that's very important. The problem when you can use only every box only once is much harder. So here we assume that you have any, uh, the, that you have unlimited supply of each box. Uh, yes? Why would you need six instead of three? Like, uh, because, I mean, it is kind of enough, but uh, uh, you can uh, have a box. Yeah, I guess uh, it's enough. Be well, no, because you see, maybe one box looks like this, uh, and the other box uh, uh, looks uh, like that. So this way, this cannot go on top, but if you rotate it, uh, it becomes like this, and now it's okay. So you have three faces, uh, but each face uh, can be rotated in two different ways. Aren't you ordering on area? Yeah, I am ordering on area, breaking events arbitrarily. So why do you need the combination of uh, Because some of these uh, will be possible to be used, some of them with a different rotation, like here, for example. Right? These two boxes must be in the chain next to each other because they have the same surface area. One can work, the other cannot. So to keep things simple, we account for both positions by treating them as a separate box. But we need, as uh, 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 this gentleman remarked, we need uh, uh, the, uh, then uh, unlimited amount of boxes. Why? Uh, so that uh, uh, we make sure that uh, um, we, you know, the question whether this box can be used or not, if you don't have multiple objects, maybe it was used uh, over there in, with a different side, uh, not rotated like this, but actually flipped to a different face. So you need them in any, um, of course you don't need uh, uh, I mean, if you don't like having six, three is enough, but then at each stage you have to check, you have to look for the both possibilities, how you use it. Okay. So, um, here is another example of a simple dynamic programming that... Uh, so, you have a river right? And these are um, trading stations. And at each trading station, you can rent a canoe. Now, you are given the price of renting a canoe at each station I and returning the canoe at station J. So, you have a table of course, you can go because your physical fitness is my, like mine, so you can go only downstream uh, with a canoe. You cannot go back and then... Uh, um, so you have a table of the prices uh, from I to J, and J has to be larger than I, 
right? So it will be a table that looks like this, only this portion will be filled, right? For every i, uh, you have uh, um, a price to each of the j's. Your task is, uh, uh, so you rent a canoe, you return it here, you rent another one, go somewhere here and then you want to go from the top to the very bottom in the cheapest possible way. How would you solve this problem? Hmm? The problem is this, so this is a river. You can see it's a river, right? <laughs> and these are trading posts. For each pair, you are given the price for going from i that proceeds, not for each pair, but for each pair so that the i is smaller than j. You are given the price to rent a canoe at i and return it to j. You want to make the whole trip from the beginning to the end, spending as little money as possible. How do you solve this problem? Well, bottom up, how would you, if you do it bottom up, you don't know what's the price to get here. But if you start from the top, what will be the sub problems that you will try? So you will simply say for any, say M, you will look, you will look for all the stations up that precede it. You have calculated in your table the prices, optimal prices to get to all of these. Then to each optimal price, you will add the corresponding cost to go immediately to the next one. Right? So, um, and you will take the mean of it. Right? So it's straightforward. Okay, this is a simple dynamic programming, but you can reduce this problem and kill it by heavy, heavier duty machinery. What is this problem essentially equivalent to? If you think of the trading posts as vertices of a graph, what are you looking? You are looking for the shortest path from the top to the bottom. But the Dijkstra's algorithm, if you think in a dynamic programming way, is actually much more complicated than this DP because here the graph is in what order? How do we call the order when all edges go from previous to the next? Topological, topological ordering, right? Topological ordering of a graph is if the indices, I mean, if the vertices are indexed, all the edges go from the direction of smaller indexed to the higher indexed, and then this simplifies the DP recursion, unlike the one in general Dijkstra. Okay, we will continue on Monday. Please do yourself a favor and try to solve as many of these as possible. Once we are done with this, we will get a new batch. But that's what we are going to do until the end of the class. <laughs>